Well, it gives me great pleasure now to hand the stage back to the Filecoin Foundation, our partners here at the Filecoin Sanctuary. We're going to take the next 30 minutes to look at what a, fa a fast growing area, of course, that's the decentralized web. That's something that the Filecoin uh, Foundation are very heavily involved with uh, and looking at the global traction that it's getting. Now, I'm delighted to welcome onto the stage now Danny O'Brien. He is Senior Fellow at Filecoin Foundation and he is going to introduce his esteemed panelists. So, Danny? If you'd like to come up with your guests, and a big round of applause, please, for Danny O'Brien. Nice to see you. That was an energetic jump up. Well Thank done. you very yeah. much. I am a Good. ball of yeah. energy. Well, well that's uh, that's what, here we go. Welcome our guests to the stage. Thank you so much. Sit yourself down. Great. Everyone's got water. That's fantastic. Perfect. So I am a little ball of energy right now because this is, I'm very excited about this panel. Um, I work for the Falcon um, Foundation. I'm a senior fellow here there. And one of the... Um, goals we have at the foundation and the project as a whole, and as Alyssa mentioned to me, sort of the whole crypto community in general, is um, we're trying to decentralize everything. We're trying to decentralize the world, take power and spread it out. But that raises so many problems, right? And we have this in our own world, right? We're in the middle of an ecosystem, and you know the foundation is sort of the arbiter of this ecosystem. Um, but we, we, our job is to spread power around. So I'm always looking for advice about how to do that, and I'm always thinking about how to extrapolate that out to the wider world. Alyssa, Alyssa, I, I'm a great fan of your work. We've talked about this in the past. Alyssa is um, a, a, a coach, a guru um, to many startups. You have an amazing podcast uh, and book called From Startup to Grown Up, which is like one of the best book titles I've seen in this. I mean, no competition. It was good. Also That's good, a good title. Um, it's, it's a fantastic guide for Thank people you. like us trying to get through this. And you've built that through conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's like a really great practical source. Um, Amy, Amy Wilkinson, I'm in awe because uh, uh, you are the person who I think in the world is one of the great kind of academic minds to understand how startups and founding works. You're a, you're a professor. At, I'm, I'm telling you this, you know it already, but okay. she's a professor at Stanford. You've got a great book called The Creator's Code, like how to, how to um, crack the code of being creative in this space. And you've built all of that knowledge on practical experience with all of these people who've built the modern digital world. Right. So now I get to ask you <laughs> what to do. So here's, here's, my, here's my premise, right? Um, we're pushing towards decentralization. And in many ways, the world is increasingly decentralized, hopefully, right? Power is coming from the Davoses and going out to the rest of the world. And I think people, when they think of leadership, I think the naive version of leadership is, um, oh, you just order people around, right? You're in charge and you get to do that. But in a decentralized world, that's, that's, that's not, I mean, if it was ever the case, it's, it's not the case now. And you have, to, you, you have to deal with a little bit of power and turn that into a project and gather it out. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Alyssa, let me ask you the first question, which is how to do that. <laughs> like when you're starting, when you're an early, very early stage startup, yeah. How do you do it? You, all you can do to inspire people yeah. is a promise, a dream that you have. How do you bring people together to work on a project that's just an idea in your head? Yes, thank you, Danny, for a nice introduction. And that's a perfect question because I wrote about that in From Startup to Grown Up, which is the idea that when you are a founder and all you have is a dream and a vision, it's actually kind of the most important thing to think about who's gonna be on that founding team. Right. So in startup world, you know, I think a lot about the different generations of the, uh, the executives and leadership team and employees that are going to work in startup. It's kind of like the early days, then the middle days, and for the long term. So they need different experiences, and very often they are not the same person. So in, to your point, in the early days, very much a founder will tap into people around him or her that he or she already knows. So classmates from college, workmates, people that are kind of already in their ecosystem, already in their sort of zone of trust. And those people need to be purpose-driven, believe in the vision, are going to work really hard, and also be kind of scrappy and ability to do a lot of different things together um, so that they can ultimately 
band together and take this idea, this vision, this just sort of dream, and turn it into something that begins to have teeth. So it's scrappy, it's hustle, it's in the zone of trust, and it's people who are kind of multifaceted and can, and can be proactive and do a bunch of different things. So do people, Amy, maybe this is because you, you, you follow the whole life cycle of, of startups. Does that mean that if we have a certain kind of people that can pull together power from, um, from a small local community, what happens as the organization grows and has a little locus of power? Do you have to, does everybody have to change? Do you have to like have a change of the guard? How do founders survive that transition? Uh, so I completely agree, uh, you know, that founders, startups have to network minds. And in the work that I did, I interviewed the 200 top entrepreneurs in the United States and distilled the mindset skill set they have in common. And um, one of those skills is called network minds. You want to pull ideas towards you. You want to pull cognitive diversity. You know, uh, our brain power is very different. It doesn't have as much to do with what we look like on the outside. It's what our brain power is on the inside. So you can have an anthropologist and a computer scientist work together. Um, you can have an extrovert and an introvert work together. You can have a convergent thinker and a divergent thinker work together. And that's how we're going to solve problems in new ways. So you see that, to your question, you see that at the very beginning of startups. And then you definitely see it with scale-ups. And the last five years at Stanford, I've looked at this question of, can you be an entrepreneur in a legacy business? Can you drive this oh. entrepreneurial mindset skill set across very large institutions? And I believe that's the next frontier of entrepreneurship. And we're going to see, and, there, and I can give some examples you know, if you're interested. But some very large legacy businesses do a pretty good job at this. So it's not just a startup thing. I mean, the decentralized leadership approach, I believe, is the next wave of leadership, period. Like, that's just what we're going to see. Which is your favorite out of those examples? Like you said, oh, I have examples. And uh, so I think the company that does this the best right now is Amazon. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're a huge company. Mm -hmm. And right. they were founder driven. To your question, like, can a founder continue to grow? Yes. I mean, obviously, Jeff Bezos did. Um, I think Brian Chesky at Airbnb is another phenomenal example. I mean, he's still the CEO. That's grown enormously. But Amazon does a couple things. And you know, I'll tell you, one of them is to source new ideas coming up across that business. Uh, they have this PR FAQ, public relations frequently asked questions, right? And if you want to propose an idea, you have to write it up as if you're pitching it as a press release right. to the consumer. Um, you have to convince the people around you. You have to network minds. You have to do this you know, very informal kind of organic um, approach. If you can convince some people to do that, you get a two pizzas team budget, You know, enough money to feed your team on two pizzas at night, so a very little bit of budget. Uh, as you continue to grow, assuming that you are looking for bigger and bigger budget, many people across Amazon can green light a project. It's not just your boss, right? And so that is sort of mirroring startup world. Because a startup will go to a venture capitalist looking for funding. You can get turned down 50 times on Sand Hill Road, and the next venture capitalist can fund you, and it's right. a go. Mm -hmm. And in traditional organizations, you didn't have you know, 50 or 75 or whatever different people who could green light your project. Mm -hmm. But at Amazon, you have that, right? So you can continue to shop it around. Uh, it's how AWS came up through their system. It's how a lot of different ideas. Amazon Go, they're so shopping. I, yeah. I find this fascinating because like, one of the things about that growth is, and the, one of the ways that, that Amazon has preserved that sort of scrappy character is definitely kind of in, imprinting those early values and maintaining them as time goes on. But like one of the struggles, I mean, I have, there are people better at it than me in the Protocol Labs extended cinematic universe, but <laughs> is that we try, we, we try to do that, right? We, try, and we, we have many little sub-organizations, we nucleate, we spin these things off all the time to live up to the decentralized value. But the problem with that is, is it means that you're very, you have a very permeable membrane, right? Mm -hmm. New ideas come in, new values, you take advantage of that cognitive diversity. How do, you, how do you maintain your values in that situation, right? Like when an organization grows, new people come in, and honestly, like one of the hardest things I have is I have to like give them the brain, the decentralizing talk, right? Because they're like, well, why can't we just tell people what to do, right? Right, because right. also their background very often is they're coming from a place where we told people what to do and they have a more hierarchical structure. Yeah, exactly. And just exactly. to say one thing about that, 
is that it's important, first of all, to even define what does decentralized mean and what do we mean by that? And how do we all sort of inculcate each other into that culture? So I think, first of all, like really having a sense of what does it actually mean in a defined way? And then having some structures and processes and defined roles and responsibilities that will then support that structure. And then to your point, you bring new people on. So being able to have a really seamless onboarding process for them so that they really know what to expect. One of my clients recently from a very hot startup, uh, he said to me, we made this mistake. We hired all these people and then we forgot to train them. Yeah. And now what we're doing in this downturn, we're taking advantage of this and we're recognizing that we need to spend our time and energy training our people into what is required, the way we work, how to collaborate together, and what clear roles look like for them. So, I so I'll, oh, give, yeah. it, I'll yeah. give an example too, Back, staying on the thread of Amazon. So you know they have grown that to a very large business and one of the key mechanisms to do it is something around decision making. Mm -hmm. So decentralized leadership speeds up decisions because you push them out to the front lines, right? right? And then the question is, well, how do you actually manage that? What do you do to make that work? And one of the things that Amazon has done is talked about one-way versus two-way doors. And so a one-way door is a decision you can only go through once, you can never come back. Hmm. So in their case, that would be the acquisition of Whole Foods. It's a big one. Like, we're gonna make a big acquisition, we're gonna have physical store presence on the ground. Uh, that kind of a decision would have to go right to the CEO, the C-suite. That would take more time. It would take higher level input. But the vast majority of every decision that's made in a business is a two-way door, which is you can go through the door. If it's not right, you can come back. You can launch a product. If it's not right, you can relaunch. You can do a marketing campaign. If it flops, do another one. Like We think they're one-way doors, but they're not. And so the way decentralized leadership works is you push all of these two-way door decisions out, which is you know 90% probably of what a business is going to contemplate, mm -hmm. is very much a recoverable thing. You can make right. the decision, come back from the decision. Mm -hmm. right. And so that speeds it, and it um, allows sort of all of your people out in front to realize they're going to make the calls. Yeah. And then they can come back, and you, know, you can iterate around on those decisions. You make them fast. That, that's so well said. Can I say one thing and maybe no. just end a dialogue? <laughs> I'm I know. just going to sit back. I, know, I, I'm just learning. Just to say, I think that's a, that's a very powerful example, and I love that. And some of my clients really struggle with this, this point, which is our people are concerned about making of a decision. Mm -hmm. Our people don't make the decision, right? So I think it's an interesting, you, I, I love that, I agree with you 100% in Amazon, and that culture is a great example. I think my experience is that you have to do like an above average job, like an extraordinary job, really making people make the decision, being accountable, and then not punishing them for right. making the wrong decision. Right. What do you think about so that? So I, I agree with this. And then the add-on to that is you need to have people practice. Right. Excellent. People have to practice making decisions. And so you have to give, you know, kind of the first steps of, huh. you know, make a smaller decision. Oh, you feel comfortable doing that. Make the next one, make yeah. the next one, make the next one. And we try to teach this. I mean, I teach MBA students, so we can put people in scenarios even. Here's the decision scenario. How do you sort of get more confident in making those decisions? I, honestly, and I keep seeing this, I completely accept the, the how do we define decentralized. But when, when, when we're dealing with this on a, on a practical stage, one of the challenges I always find is like, we want to give people autonomy, but people aren't used to autonomy, exactly. right? So, so taking this out of the business sense, like it, on the web, on the centralized web, people have grown very accustomed to having social media, you know, Mark Zuckerberg make decisions about these things. And when you go, oh, we can give you more power, I think people go, I'm not sure I'm, I'm up to it, right? I'm not sure, like uh, when people recently have moved from Twitter to a decentralized system, Mastodon, one of the features of Mastodon is smaller communities make their content moderation decisions themselves. And people are like, can I do that? Is mm -hmm. that a thing? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, that's, I definitely hear that in organizations. I have a question as both of you as teachers, which is um, uh, a decentralized system requires a lot of communication, constantly checking mm -hmm. in, right? You've, you've got to do that. Um, and we've talked about sort of spreading values. What's the most efficient way of spreading those values? There's practice, right? There's role playing. Um, I'm a great, I was very inspired by Apple University. 
mm -hmm. right? I saw that when they, did, when they did that where they went, after the tragic passing of Steve Jobs, they went, how can we pass these, these values on? And at what point should a startup start thinking about building their university? Do you want to jump in? Oh, sure. Well, I think that, um, so startups don't have to start thinking about building their university, but they do have to think about building their values early and quickly and um, I would say robustly because ultimately startups really are, especially the sort of the essence of shadow of a leader. So one of the founders I work with, she once said, you know, I can be indecisive. And then I hire all these people and I watch them be indecisive. Yeah. And um, it is so clear that, you know, the company really lives in the shadow of that leader. So I think it's essential Two other founders I work with, they spent two years in the bedroom of one of their parents building their company, like sort of early days of building their company. And they talked about the kind of company we want to live, to work, come to work every day. So when you really have that sense and you build it out robustly, then you want to hire people for that. So people make, they, the companies make the mistakes or startups make the mistakes of hiring people based on just their intellect or just their experience without taking into account the bigger picture values. Mm -hmm. And so getting that in your mind's eye, again, my, my watchword, my, my constant religion is <laughs> intentionally and defining it and setting a clear sort of roadmap for what that looks like and then hiring based on that is going to help startups in early days create that culture and have those values. And then ultimately, of course, you have to find ways to inculcate that through universities. I mean, I know that GE has fallen out of, out of favor these days, but GE had an exceptional training program in their leadership development area where everybody really understood the GE way, which you know, like it or don't like it, it was sort of a, a common framework we all had. Yeah. I agree with that. So the GE way was the beacon, not only for GE, but so many other mm -hmm. companies, right? Um, you know, Jack Welch and the top down kind of neutron Jack uh, era is really a bygone era. Yeah. And so I, I think to the question of should there be a university where you teach this stuff? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But I think that any business really it's easier at the start to uh, develop a culture and live the culture. I think now there's so much transparency and there's so much speed of communication that whatever you are doing, you the founder, you the leadership team, you the early employees, uh, it's gonna be very well known. And so that's something that you just have to live a set of values. As you grow, then you also have to have, you know, uh, people ambassadors within your organization that continue to carry the same value set. And you know whether you look at uh, Airbnb as a great example, Amazon, there were many people that just stepped out of Amazon with Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. which basically means they were there for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and they spread out as that organization grew. Yeah. Uh, they're not necessarily a quote university, but they're teaching their value system, they're teaching the culture, and then they are running you know, big business units as a company continues to grow. Yeah. Right. So transparency is, the, is, is, I think, one of these underlying things in the decentralized. Uh, to talk personally, like one of the things that helped me understand how um, Filecoin worked is that every, a lot of the meetings are recorded and mm. then put on YouTube immediately. So we have developer, internal development meeting. I'm like, who watches it? Well, I, I watched it, right? Because I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I need to know what's going on. And of course, that's a great recruiting opportunity, right? Yeah. The, the, one, of the, one of the ways that the benefits of a decentralized system is you build these intentional communities, right? People go, ah, like you may be in Kenya, but you're my kind of person. I'm going right. to go and work with you. But to, to what you were saying about building a culture, isn't there a danger that this works against the cognitive diversity thing? Is there a danger of like, you know, people start hiring for culture fit and then you get, you, you get a kind of group think and you end up kind of wandering off, off the mainstream? Do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. So um, I think recruiting and hiring is absolutely essential in, and even more so probably in a decentralized system. Right, because you're gonna give a lot of autonomy, a lot of responsibility, a lot of decision-making power. And so who you select to sort of be involved with what you're trying to build uh, is really important. Uh, but I, you know, I, it, it's something that as, as these organizations continue to grow, the communication is so fast 
and the technology underlying our ability to communicate really rapidly continues to just you know move and put momentum forward. Yeah. So, but I think it matters who you hire as as the very beginning. Yeah. I think to your point, and it's very, I think it's a real problem, the idea of hiring the same person over and over because you feel comfortable and there's a cultural fit. I think we have all gotten our consciousness raised on that over the past few years about what a monoculture right. looks like. Right. Um, that's a difficult problem because you do want this ease of communication and ease of ability to work together and the ability to have some shorthand, but you also want to what Amy said earlier, the, the diversity, the cognitive diversity, all the different ways that we think about diversity. I think the way to approach that, there's not a solution, but the way to approach that is number one, be very clear in who, who like who's going to... Um, kind of bring our company to that ultimate vision or purpose or whatever that is, and what kind of place we want to look at, we want to work at. And then to um, one of the founders I work with, he says to me, he said to me, I know I have blind spots, so I make sure that I have two or three people also interviewing this person, you know, especially key roles, who uh, I don't tell them what I think about it, about this person. And so he already knows that this person often disagrees with him, this person has a different perspective, and he wants those kinds of people to interview new people so that we know we're not just creating oh, a monoculture. Yeah, right. to get, yeah. get yeah. rid of my own blind spot. The second thing I would say is that it's, um, uh, actually it was Amazon that was a company that, there was a, a division of Amazon that realized, we're hiring too many men. I wonder what's going on. And what they decided to do was to say, we are gonna give women a second interview no matter what. And lo and behold, they passed the first screening, they got into the interview process, and they hired a lot more women as a result of that. Not because of so-called, you know, sort of, um, you know, credit giving because they're a woman. It just simply because once they got past that first screening, screening they were very successful in the process itself. Mm -hmm. So then they saw, we have a blind spot in this process. It's not perfect. But being mindful of it is going to help you develop your own strategy and your intention to not develop a monoculture and then making sure that you have the systems and structures to continue to communicate together and collaborate together. Right. So I'll add one thing to that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you can sort of by design build in debate. And conflict is good. Uh, you know, a lot of large organizations are conflict diverse. A lot of people are conflict diverse. And conflict. But really, <laughs> but yeah. No. But really, what you um, find is if you encourage people that you're working with to bring their ideas forward, they're not going to agree. If you say that's what we want, uh, they will continue to have a robust dialogue, and you avoid this kind of monoculture. And I'll give you one of the great examples in Silicon Valley is the PayPal team, mm. right? And early on. It, uh, you know, those founders, there was a lot of rough and tumble, a lot of debate about what to do. They obviously succeeded. In 2002, they went public, sold to eBay. They created the entire next wave of the internet. So, you know, they're LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp founders, et cetera. Um, they don't agree most of the time. They respect each other's point of view. They bring their ideas forward, right? And Jeremy Stoppelman, who's the founder of Yelp, he was an intern at PayPal. He, and PayPal was the merger of X.com and Confinity originally. Elon Musk was coming with X.com. Peter Thiel and Max Levchin were coming with Confinity. Um, Jeremy, as an intern, this is an example, disagreed. Elon had left as the CEO. He was reporting to a new person, Peter Thiel. He disagrees. He fires off an email saying, you are doing everything wrong. He's the intern to the CEO, right? Then he really worries, I'm going to get fired. Like wow. Elon, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But the amazing response here was that Peter Thiel calls him in and says, thank you for sending that. We want people who will speak up. Uh, we're not going to do what you suggest, but we want you and this team. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you continue to demonstrate that, the other people around watch that, right? Your culture continues to amplify yeah. debate and bringing ideas forward. 100%. Mm -hmm. Leadership matters. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's, yeah. It, it, it's funny because uh, it's great that we come back to leadership because in some ways, like, I feel like a lot of, I, Alyssa in the conversation beforehand, like, reminded me that we should talk a little bit about the, the weirdness and interesting world of, of the crypto sort mm -hmm. of, well, you, you worked at the U.S. Bitcoin Corporation. Alyssa, you, you, right. you give guidance to a lot of, a lot of the folks in crypto. Um, and... It is weird. Like, I mean, it's definitely some of it. Some of it is weird, right? But are there 
are there lessons that you're seeing in that space that maybe in the same way as, as the, the knowledge from Amazon, the knowledge from PayPal kind of bled mm -hmm. into all, all of the rest of the industry. Are there lessons that coming out of that that maybe other, other corporations can, can pick from? Yeah, I think that crypto and the sort of decentralized web have a lot to contribute to today's traditional companies, both startups and also large companies. The truth is we are now in an era, like it or not, of remote work, of hybrid work, of flexible work, and also no longer in command and control. As Amy said before, it's not gonna work anymore. It's a network-based system no matter what. And so, you know, crypto has come in and kind of popularized that idea. And I think there's a lot of lessons to sort of offer traditional companies, like the need for communication, the need for collaboration, leading with influence without always authority, and really, the clarity, I think crypto needs more work on this, and I think companies do <laughs> yeah. too, the clarity of what it looks like when it's working. Right. And so I think that if you can figure that out as in a traditional organization, you're gonna make everything so much better because you have a far-flung workforce that is not taking orders anymore. Right, right. I agree, I think the pandemic uh, really showed big companies, small companies, uh, universities, governments, mm -hmm that you had to be entrepreneurial, you had to respond. Uh, decisions had to be made at the speed of startups, startups, even if you weren't a startup, right? And that you would come from lots of different points of view. There would be lots of different inputs across. And uh, traditional t hierarchies were not gonna be the way that we all managed our lives during the middle of a global pandemic. Right, right. right. It, was, it was definitely, going into crypto, going into the Falcon Foundation, it was an organization where I was like, okay, where is the head office, right? I mean, we'd all dealt with like going remote, but surely there's a center here, right? And you know, they looked at me like a small child. Right? <laughs> but the truth is, is that we, we formed in COVID. There are mm -hmm. post-COVID companies, growing post-COVID companies, and they don't have a center. There was no original office. We have a, we use WeWorks, right? But but that's not, that's not where the center is. And of course, in a decentralized environment, there is no center, right? That's right. the whole point. Right, um, right. So can you envisage in the future, we have three minutes to go, so I'm just gonna throw out the crazy future of, of, of what we have. Um, we build the technology, and one of the things we try and build is like essentially leaderless systems, right? Um, the idea is that, uh, is that there's no one node that's saying, okay, we need to do this. You have a consensus system and everything can collectively do it and someone can, can vote and, and be that. Do you think that's something that humans can do? Can you imagine a way of organizing a company or any kind of endeavor that doesn't have a leader, a leaderless future? A leaderless future. I'll take a crack at that. <laughs> You've got two minutes to think of the, the future here. A leaderless future. So. I believe in informal leadership, mm -hmm. and I believe in what you know was really created in the 70s and 80s in companies, which is communities of practice. Right. And right. I believe in passionate people coming together around a certain cause. And in, from that point of view, it's not so much leaderless, but it's kind of, the leader is, is kind of given the authority by virtue of passion and competence. So I think a leadership community really has to do with the ability to influence others, really uh, instill confidence by showcasing competence and gaining kind of the respect and admiration of everyone around them. Now, that happens in pockets. It's gonna be very interesting to see how that really flourishes in the future with traditional companies as well as crypto companies. Um, so I don't think we're gonna see a leaderless future. I think we're gonna see a different type of leader. Mm. And it's gonna be somebody who can, um, have a lot of influence, that can sort of catalyze movements of people, can have followership. Uh, you, you know, the Arab Spring, for example, which everyone sort of pointed to as, hey, this is a totally decentralized thing. It didn't work at the end of the day because there wasn't leadership there. There was just organizing, but uh, there wasn't an underlying sort of structure that would take the kind of new thought process and put it into organizations or institutions stuff. So I think we're gonna have leaders, I think we need leaders, um, but they're gonna have completely different characteristics and they're gonna be about communication and influence and um, 
you know, and I think that we'll see the Filecoin Foundation at the frontier of that, right? Yeah, yeah, Definitely. we hope so, we hope yeah. so. so. And well, I think because of that, there's gonna need to be a new kind of way of thinking about building skills, training people, and uh, right. sort of informal mentorship back and forth. I think there's an apprenti apprentice apprenticeship sort of in the offing as yeah. well. Yeah, which is why we're I gonna- I agree with this yeah. on the training front, really important. Yeah. Which is why we're gonna keep hanging out with you both, so we can just <laughs> yeah. and, and, and build on your your um, amazing insights. Amy Wilkinson, Alyssa Cohen, thank, thank you. you so much for speaking. Thanks with thank us. very much. Thank, thank you so thank much, you. Danny. Thank you, everybody. Round of applause, please, for Danny. And that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed listening to that. Thank, thank, you, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. So you. Much.